Well, good morning. Uh, this is live from Big Bear Four Square Church, and it's good to see we have a full church today, and it's wonderful to see you. You know, your presence here in the body of Christ is highly appreciated. Personal contact, there's nothing like it. Personal smile. Get, I want to get back to the days where he gives hugs and do all that. It's coming. Amen. And, uh, but know that your presence here in the church means a lot. Uh, somebody put on Facebook, why do you go to church? And I, and I replied, because I have to, I'm the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> you have to too, because you're a Christian. Amen. Amen. Nothing encourages me to more, as much as when we get together. I preach better when you're here. Amen. Just to let you know that. Well, the message that I was given for this Easter celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, the message is called, Just As the Scriptures Said. The Lord gave me this message on Wednesday night in dreams and visions during the night, and I simply got up in the morning and over the next three or four hours on Thursday morning wrote down what he gave me. And I think that's the best way to do it, right? Get a word from God and relate it to the people. And that's what Joseph Parker called the, or the prophetic word in the pulpit. So let's pray. Father God, we're so grateful for this day of the resurrection. One of the most powerful events in all of history. We see the work of the Trinity in creation. We see the work of the Trinity in the virgin birth. And again, we see the work of the Trinity here in the resurrection of Jesus. So I pray, Lord, that you would open up our ears to hear what you have to say, open up our eyes to see what you want us to see, and help Pastor Mike to give the word today and power in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to look through verses 1 through 8. And this will be the start of the message this morning. Paul said, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I have preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. I mean, stand, standing firm in the good news. Amen. Good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's your part to stand in it. <clears throat> He has paid for it and given it to you in its full. And he, the only thing he asks of it from you is a response to stand in the faith, stand as a Christian. My, as a matter of fact, it's not easy to do these days, is it? When I got saved, actually April 2nd, 1968, during the Jesus Movement in Los Angeles and Southern California, and actually all through the world, even the rock and roll songs talked about the Bible and prayer and Jesus and, you know, uh, you know, a lot of Jesus songs. Oh, Happy Day was number one on the charts. And so it was fun and, and joyous and exciting to be a Christian. And it was even trendy to be a Christian. Those days are gone. If you're a trendy person, you got to get things straight because it's not about the trends, it's about the faith in Jesus Christ and where you stand. And you should be standing stronger than ever, no matter if the rock and roll world approves or not. Amen? Amen? Amen. You're willing to stand for Jesus? Amen. That's a day to day commitment. You know, you can't say, well, you know what, I, 
I got busy now. I'm a little busy here and this and that. I'll get back to him. Well, he's got to be number one. What is number two? Everything that's below him is an idol, right? That if if you have idols, that means he re they go to number one and Jesus goes to number two. All through the uh, all through the Old Testament and even the New Testament, John says in the in the first, second, third John, in the last verses, keep yourselves from idols. What is he talking about? We don't bring idols to the church, little stone things and different things. We bring our priorities. So get rid of whatever replaces Jesus. So back in the day, we were called Jesus freaks and all that stuff, badges of honor. That's where I am to this day. Amen. 53 years later. Verse 2, and it's the good news that saves you. And I, I'm going to outline what that is today. It's the good news that saves you. We need saving. Amen. Saving for what? Well, from hell to heaven is a good transition. Two real places. But also saving you from yourself. I say before Jesus Christ, you messed it up really good. You were really good at that. How many really an expert at messing up your life? You're really good at that. And somebody says, well, what have you been good at? Well, before Christ, I was really good at messing up my life. One time, some young man says, well, I believe I am God. And I said, well, you're doing a terrible job of it. I said, I, I hope we can have an upgrade from you. <laughs> so it's got the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Are you continuing to believe? Amen. Well, good. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. Verse 3, I passed on to you what was the most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Now, what's a sin? Well, sin is anything that's committed or omitted that offends the character and nature of God. God is holy and righteous, incapable of sin, incapable of of anything fallible. But anything that we've done that offends his character and nature, either in commission or omission, is called sin. Now, how serious is that? Well, have you ever seen The Passion of the Christ? It's a horror picture. I can't hardly take it, 45 minutes of, the, of seeing Jesus beaten the way he was. And then crucified, going through all that. Isaiah 53 says it was God's will to do all that so he can take the problem of sin for you. So we say, well, you know, Lord, I sinned. Well, in God's mind, sin is so horrific, it produced a payment in Jesus Christ that was so horrific, it's beyond belief. <laughs> Why would God do that? Well, something in God's mind sees sin as more horrific than you've ever seen it in your life. And for him to pay that price for you and me for something that was so horrific to him is really his love. Romans chapter 5 says that God loved us so much that he gave us his son in such a fashion. I, my two sons are in the room next door, Matthew 6, 5, and Matthew, Samuel 6. All of you have seen them since they were babies. Uh, 
I'm sorry, but I'm not going to give up any one of them for you. Sorry. <laughs> but God gave his one and only son for you and did what we could not do. I might give my life for you, but not one of my sons. So Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. That's the title of the message. This is what the Lord gave me that. Uh, in my vision and dreams, I asked the question, what scriptures? I'm sure you've asked that before, right? What scriptures? Well, we're going to go into that this morning. What the scripture said about death, burial, and resurrection. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. It's a pretty good church service, isn't it? 500 people are in Galilee in a remote area, mountain or valley or something. And Jesus is talking to them. And 500 people become witnesses immediately of this event. You know what history says and also our judicial system says if you have that many witnesses to an event, it's 498 more than you need. It's a lot. How many saw Jesus raised from the dead? 500 plus 12 plus others. Most of them are still alive, though some of them have died. Verse 7, Then he was seen by James, that's the Lord's brother, half-brother, and by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I saw him as well. Acts chapter 9. So when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus and the death, we find the death according to the scriptures in Isaiah chapter 53 and Psalm chapter 22, right? You're familiar with that. Isaiah 53 gives us all the reasons for Jesus on the cross. Psalm 22 gives us his thoughts, his emotions, his feelings on the cross. But then again it says that he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. So you have to go to the Old Testament and also find out what scriptures have proved that as well. But I tell you that the scriptures for the new covenant start with the lips of Jesus. What Jesus said, whenever he said it, whatever he said became the scriptures for us, especially that are recorded for us. So I'm going to look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 through 40, where Jesus himself, who is the scriptures, speaking the scriptures, said, Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. That wasn't very nice, was it? You wicked, adulterous generation. Jesus, are you talking to me? That's not very nice. We're, we're, we're in that generation multiplied, aren't we? Looking for a miraculous sign. Prove that God exists. Prove this or that. Which we can do over and over again. But even in the proof of that, people are so blinded that they reject the proof of that. So Jesus said, but the only sign... I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Jesus was crucified on the 14th of Nisan, the first day of Passover. Between the 16th and 17th of Nisan, he raised from the dead. And not only raised from the dead, he proved himself alive to multitudes of people over the next 40 days after the resurrection of the dead. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, there came out novels. One was called The Passover Plot. You heard of that? The Passover Plot was a novel that came out at Easter time one year. I think it's in the 60s, maybe 50s. And it went like this. Jesus died on the cross, and Luke came up and gave him some drugs and took him and took him out of the cross and repaired the body just enough to get him in the tomb and tended him so he was not quite dead and then they rolled away the tomb and Jesus appeared to appeared to two or three people fell over in a ditch and died and we think wow that's 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 kind of a funny wasn't funny. Millions of people, thousands of people read that book and believed that Jesus was not really dead when he was dead. And he didn't really last long because he really wasn't raised from the dead. I got news for you. Jesus was really dead. Amen. The, so, the, the piercing of his side, the proof. And they weren't going to take him off the cross unless they knew for sure that this person was dead. How dead's dead? Right. I mean, you're done. At the doornail? Okay, so not only do we have to, we have to embalm the body, kind of put uh, 75 pounds of myrinalos around him and all that. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus proved that he's dead. Now we got to wait for him to be in the tomb. Why? Because he's got he's got to be dead, dead, dead. <laughs> to everyone in Jerusalem knows that he is what dead. 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 No phony resurrections. He had to be dead, dead, dead. And then comes the resurrection day for. The unbelievable, we use phrases that we don't really mean, but we say, well, that's unbelievable. Well, believe it. He raised from the dead. Here he is to prove it. Not only did he prove it then, he's proving it now. He is with us. I hope you're a believer in things that you don't see. You know, my family's from Missouri, the show me state, meaning that they don't believe in anything they don't see. So to this day, they don't have internet. They can't see it. You realize there's so, so much of things that are reality that you can't see that are probably more than what you see here in the, yes, with sir. your eye? Yes, sir. What is unseen is, is really even more real on this earth and in heaven and in eternity than what we're able to see. You're smart enough to understand that, right? You believe, I mean, that's a no-brainer. Here I got my iPhone and we got the, this stuff here and I got my iPad notes. We got Wi-Fi going on and stuff. All things I can't see. Do I say I don't believe it because I can't see it? No. I say I believe it because it works. Amen. What's the proof of Jesus from raised from the dead? I can prove it because his life 
in you and me works. He answers prayer, gives us pre pre gives, answers our prayers. He gives us peace. He gives us the presence of God. It would take for me to deny that I'd have to deny my very existence to get my psychic mind and spirit to deny what I just told you. John chapter 2, verse 19, and, and, and we can say it as the scripture said, because Jesus said it. Jesus says, all right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple, speaking of his body, and in three days I will raise it up. Wow. Everything hinged on that prophecy because if this is not true, none of it's true. It is true. Some people say, well, you know what, I'm a Christian, but I don't like this stuff about the resurrection and I don't like the stuff about the virgin birth. I say, well, don't fool yourself. You're not a Christian. It's a package deal. <laughs> The virgin birth, the sinless life, death, burial, and resurrection, 40 days on this earth, ascension into heaven, and seated at the right hand of God the Father. Amen. It's a package deal. If you don't like parts of it, you're not a Christian. Is that too harsh? No. Are you, are, I mean, I'm speaking harsh to you, unbelieving, perverse generation. Uh, that might offend you, right? Part of the package. Part of the package. Yeah. <laughs> On the first message to be preached by Peter in Acts chapter 2, after this has all been accomplished and Jesus is in, is in heaven, he says in verse 24, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him. I see the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he's right beside me. How many know what David's talking about? No wonder my heart is glad, and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my life, my soul, among the dead, or allow the Holy One to rot in the grave. That's Meanie, our neighborhood dog. Yeah, Meanie. Amen. So Jesus' life and his body was not to remain in the grave. This is predicted by David. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Verse 29, dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the, the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried in his tomb in Sheol, Hades, the place of the dead, or allow his body to rot in the grave, Greek words, Hades, Sheol, the grave. But God raised him from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Verse 33, now he's exalted to the place of the highest honor in heaven at God's right hand, and the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see in here today. Amen. You believe that? Yes. Not a good word for you? Yes. I believe that. People believe that so much that they, gave their, they give their lives for that. For the most part, you give nothing for that. For the most part. 
in your future, you might have to give something for that, but not right now. But all over the world, people are laying down their lives because they believe this, what Peter had said. So, where else does the scripture say he must raise from the dead? Well, Psalm chapter 22, where you got the thoughts of Jesus, the feelings of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus is on the cross, Psalm 22, it opens up by, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? And that's how the psalm starts. Well, Jesus quoted this entire psalm through the time of his crucifixion. And verse 22 starts a turn from the crucifixion to something else. He says, I will proclaim your name among my brothers and sisters. Oh, I will rise from the dead. I will proclaim my name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among the assembled people. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All you who fear him, honor him. All you descendants of Jacob, show him reverence and all the descendants of Israel. Verse 24, for he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has turned, not turned his back on them, but he has listened to your cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. That's a promise. He says, I will fulfill my vows in the presence of of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied, and all who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. Is that you? Your hearts rejoice with everlasting joy? You know, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, that if the resurrection did not happen, we are the most pitiful people on the earth for believing something so foolish if it was not true. Your hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him for the royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all nations. Let the earth of the rich of the earth feast and worship, bow before him, all who are mortal. All whose lives will end in dust, our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. He is righteous, his acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. You know, the thing about prophecy, David shared this psalm 1,000 years before Jesus was ever born. 1,000 years. And in the Hebrew and in the Greek Septuagint and the, and the prophecies fulfilled from this Psalm 22, it's impossible to say that David could even fulfill it in his body or in his day. Amazing. Isaiah 53 are the reasons for the cross. Let me tell you about Isaiah 53. The Jewish rabbis have taken it out of their Haftor readings for the synagogues hundreds of years ago because they knew it would point people to Jesus. So they've taken this whole chapter out of their reading in the synagogues with the Torah and the Haftor and the servants preach. Not allowed to do it. It's called the forbidden chapter. But Isaiah 53, verse 10 
says this after the crucifixion. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was laid upon him. He bore the iniquities of us all. By his stripes we are healed. Verse 10, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. You know, if you and I were at the time of the cross and we were seeing people abusing Jesus like that, our tendency would be to try to stop it, right? Mm -hmm. Let me take the... And we'd try to we'd tackle that guy with the nails and the hammer or whatever we could do to stop it. But if we tried to stop it, we would be trying to stop our very salvation. You are the reason that that was happening. And it was God's will that he goes through that process for you and me. We go, you mean everything that the Rome did was God's will? Everything that Caiaphas and Annas and the Jews did was God's will? Everything that the, the, the crowd shouted, crucify him, crucify him, was God's will. Everything that happened. But it was God's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. Wow. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, yours too, mine too. He will have many descendants. Here's the promise. He will enjoy a long life. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all this that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for you, for many, to be encountered, counted righteous. You are righteous because of him. Amen. You're nothing, not, not righteous without him. Right? So here you can say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Not me, it's all him. What does being good do for you eternally? Is you live the best life you have and reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, you just reserved yourself a spot in hell for rejecting the Jesus Christ, your Lord. How good's good? I tell you, if you think you're good, somebody's better than you. If you're the best one to live on the planet, somebody's better than you. What's the standard? God said, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. So he brought Jesus to make up the difference. You've heard me tell the story, right? He, this guy who died and went, went to heaven stood before St. Peter and Peter says, well, you know, you, you need 100 points to get in here. So start. Okay. Well, I was a pretty good guy. Okay, well, give you a good point for that. I was a good husband. Give you a, maybe two points for that. I was a good father. We'll give you another point for that word for. I worked hard all my life. We'll give you another point of five. I was a good friend to my friends, six. I did good things. I went to Pastor Mike's church. We'll give you one for that, seven. Oh. I don't know what else to tell you, Peter. If it's not for the grace of God, I'm going to hell. Well, that's good for 93. <laughs> Your best life plus Jesus' sacrifice equals 100 points. Verse 12, Isaiah 53. I will give him the honors of the victorious soldier, 
because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and intercedes for the rebels. Proven by the scripture, proven by so many things. He loves you. When you say, how can a loving God allow things to happen? Well, first of all, Adam and Eve gave all the authority of this earth to Satan, and Satan became the prince and power of this era, and we live in a cursed earth. Somebody says, well, you know what? My Christian friend stepped up on a rock and fell a thousand feet to his death off the mountain and died. How could God let that happen? No. Gravity caused the guy to fall, right? And you know what? Gravity's pretty unforgiving. So how can you blame God for what gravity did? I mean, the whole logic to it is not very deep. But he loves you. You, the fact that you're here proves to me that God's been involved with your life all your life. Amen. Thank God for that. I, one of the great gifts I had today was I woke up to a, a phone call from a, a young man, he's 72 now, Steve Ashoff, I say Steve's name, a childhood friend. And I knew his grand grandmother and his parents really well, his th two brothers and sister. Found out today Steve is the only one left. But the whole family over the last 20 years found the Lord, loved the Lord. Isn't that, isn't that what it's all about? Amen. Amen. That's the ultimate question. Mm -hmm. Did they know the Lord? Well, they left you a million dollars. I don't care about that. Did they know the Lord? <clears throat> That's the ultimate question. He is risen. He is risen indeed. If you need to know this risen Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer right now and pray for the congregation. Dear Lord Jesus, Please come into my heart and forgive me for all my sins, the things that have offended you. And write my name in the book of life and give me the Holy Spirit. Lord, I commit my life to you right now and I receive the sacrifice that you have given. Father God, I thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. Thank you that Jesus raised himself. Thank you that the power of the Holy Spirit in Romans 1 verse 4 raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you that this was verified and witnessed over 40 days by hundreds of people. Thank you that I'm now a product of that fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. Bless your people. Keep them. Minister life to them. And I thank you for my dear friends here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.